Good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be here. I'm so uh, happy to come. I wasn't really sure what was going to be happening here, but uh, I've already learned quite a bit. I must say that there are really very special people here that uh, have really been touched by some of the presentations that I've heard. Uh, I went to college here at the University of Florida, and uh, I was here in the late 70s and just ready to graduate. Only had a couple classes, statistics, geology. I, I had a double major all finished, ready to go. And I got recruited by the United Farm Workers Union. Uh, we had a student group here at the time. We were doing support work for the striking farm workers in California. And there was a lettuce boycott. And so we had a campaign to get the lettuce out of the school cafeterias. Uh, here, and I got offered a job to organize fruit pickers, orange pickers, grapefruit pickers across the state. So I quit college never to graduate, to become an organizer. I've been one ever since. Uh, and uh, in the early 80s, I went into the peace movement, and because I lived in Orlando at the time, I began to learn about the space program and how the plan to move the arms race into space, Star Wars. And so I've been working on that ever since. So that's my main specialty. But in recent years, I've also begun to specialize on the connection between the military and climate change. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Unlimited and unregulated capitalist development has put Mother Earth into toxic shock. Human, plant, and animal species are now at risk of extinction. The Native Americans said when the white man came to this continent, they noticed something very strange about him, that he was blinded by his love for the green frog skin. The white man couldn't see beyond the green frog skin, and thus his connection to nature was snapped like a stick, and it was a spiritual connection as much as anything else. I'll never forget that in 1998 here in Florida, there was a governor's race that I followed very closely. There was a decent man by the name of Buddy McKay. He was from Ocala nearby. He easily won the Democratic nomination. One of McKay's key campaign themes was he wanted to limit growth in Florida. He said Florida was running out of water and had reached its carrying capacity as a state, and that unregulated growth was essentially a cancer uh, to the state. However, McKay was soundly defeated in the general election by his re uh, Republican opponent, a Miami real estate developer from uh, a famous American family. His name was Jeff Bush. In Bush's inaugural address in Tallahassee in the Capitol, he stood there amongst the tall skyscraper buildings of the Capitol area, and he said, my dream is that someday all of these buildings will be gone. And what he was really saying was he wanted to get rid of regulation, regulation of corporations, regulation of growth, regulations of uh, you know, any restraints whatsoever on corporate profitability. And then his brother in 2003, George W. Bush, initiated the shock and awe invasion of Iraq, which signaled a desperate plan on the part of U.S. and Western corporate oligarchs that the coming period would be one expensive and destructive war after the other for resource control and resource extraction around the globe. And thus today we witness an ugly string of wars and regime change operations in Libya, Syria, Venezuela, Iran, and possibly even Russia. The Rand Corporation in California, most famous for uh, the Pentagon Papers during the Vietnam War, the, uh, the Rand Corporation has called for the balkanization of Russia, the breaking of Russia into smaller countries that would make it possible for Western oil corporations to con take control of that vast country. And you know, when you look at a map, you see that Russia has the largest land border with the Arctic Sea. And because of climate change, it will soon be possible to do what was never possible before, drill baby drill in the Arctic. 
And so this is one reason I would submit to you for all the Russia gate stuff that we see today. And for the recent major escalation of NATO up into that part of the world where they're literally encircling Russia with military capability. During the Iraq mess, the Pentagon claimed that America's role under corporate globalization of the world economy would be security export. In other words, endless war on behalf of fossil fuel corporations. America, they said, would not make anything anymore. We're not going to make shoes, cars, refrigerators, cell phones. We're going to make war and weapons of war. Essentially, we've been privatized, privatized uh, foreign policy and turned over to the uh, weapons, uh, or the uh, resource extraction corporations. So today, the Pentagon has the largest carbon boot print on the planet, using more oil than all the oil combined of 175 other nations. Yet the U.S. demanded and received a blanket exemption for the Pentagon from all international climate agreements uh, beginning at Kyoto in 1997. And the Pentagon is even doing weather modification experimentation. And many scientists are now saying that one of the reasons for the uh, crazy weather variations around the world is because of the Pentagon weather modification experimentation. When you start lifting the ionosphere and doing other kind of experimentations, you literally set in motion a whole uh, number of, of uh, realities that no one could ever predict or, or uh, estimate. Currently, the U.S. military budget is over $1 trillion a year. Once you add up all the various Pentagon pots of gold where the money is hidden, just one example is nuclear weapons are, are uh, inside of the Department of Energy budget, not really inside of the Pentagon budget. So again, when you add it all up, it's a trillion dollars a year. So there can be no effective response to climate catastrophe unless and until the massive Pentagon budget is cut and redirected. We must, yesterday, overturn the entire global fossil fuel industrial system that now is ruining the world. Where will the money come from to do this? I often go up to environmental groups who are doing wonderful work on climate change, and I say to them, where are you going to come up with the money to do the reordering of this fossil fuel system that we need to do. Where's that money gonna come from in your plan? And they have no response whatsoever. And they often say, well, you know, when I tell them, well, what about converting the military industrial complex, cutting the military budget? They say, you know, we have very good relationships with the Democrats. And if we begun talking about the, de the uh, military budget, we would lose that relationship with the Democratic Party. So that kind of gives you a hint about where things are in America today. So with, uh, our position then is we must demand the immediate conversion of the military industrial complex to useful production rather than weapons in war. This has in fact been successfully done before in the United States. Three examples come to mind, although I'd not endorse any or all of them. First was the World War II era conversion of American industry, when President Roosevelt demanded that existing companies immediately convert for war production. Secondly was the Manhattan Project, when that secret crash technology uh, operation created the atomic bomb. And then third was JFK's Man on the Moon program, that again focused technology and development that took astronauts to the moon. So when we put our minds to it and put the resources into it, we can do what is urgently needed, but the political will has to be there. Thus, I believe that nonviolent resistance movements are now needed to protect the environment and the future generations. In my community, <coughs> excuse me, of Maine where I live, in the mid coast of Maine, we've been campaigning for many years to do this very thing at a Navy shipyard called Bath Ironworks, which is owned by General Dynamics Corporation. They build nothing but destroyers 
at this Navy shipyard. We've organized peace walks up and down our state uh, five times in the last six years, bringing this message to our fellow citizens. We've undertaken a statewide media campaign to call for a, a conversion, which includes more than 100 letters to the editor in 25 newspapers across the state. Two years ago, General Dynamics demanded that our very poor state give them $60 million in tax breaks. We organized a statewide campaign to oppose the tax breaks, instead demanding that General Dynamics convert to deal with climate crisis. I undertook a 37-day hunger strike and spent many days leafleting the workers at the shipyard talking to them about climate crisis and the conversion idea. Many workers told me they'd rather not be building destroyers. They'd rather be doing something good and useful, but hey, we need a job. I have a family, you know the story. In the end, the machinist union, which was at the shipyard, which was under immense pressure by the politicians of the state to vote in support of this tax break, they eventually had a vote at a general meeting, and the vote was 50-50, 50% in favor, 50% opposed. So for us, it was a great victory to essentially neutralize the union, more than 3,500 workers, them not taking a position on this tax break bill. This was a big deal in our state, and in fact, not one newspaper reported it. The state government ended up cutting the $60 million request by $15 million, but our conversion message was given a huge boost from all the activity that we created around the state. We've repeatedly also had people arrested at Bath Ironworks for nonviolent attempts to block the christening ceremonies of the destroyers at the shipyard. At the most recent a uh, late April christening of the new destroyer called LBJ, named after Lyndon Baines Johnson, the Vietnam War president. 25 of our friends were arrested that day for blocking the traffic as they tried to bus people in to the shipyard for the ceremony. And amazingly, we got more coverage on this than anything we've ever done all over the state. Uh, the media covered these arrests and talked about primarily our message of converting because of climate crisis. The LBJ stealth destroyer cost $7 billion, that's billion with a B, money that could have uh, outfitted 350,000 homes in our state with solar energy. That would be almost one out of every three houses in the state of Maine. We only have about 1.2 million people. We have more trees than, than people in Maine, which is a good thing, right? Another destroyer will be christened on June 22nd. And once again, we've signed up another large group of people, more than 20, who are going to risk arrest, again calling for the conversion of the shipyard. Studies at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in the uh, economics department and also at Rhode Island's Brown University Watson Institute clearly show that military production is the worst way to create jobs because weapons production is capital intensive. Every other kind of uh, expenditure is labor intensive. You get more jobs for any other kind of spending. So building commuter rail systems, offshore wind turbines in the Gulf of Maine, we have more wind capacity there than in any other part of the United States of America. So offshore wind turbines, commuter rail systems, tidal power systems, things like this at Bath Ironworks would create many more jobs and help us turn away from our addiction to fossil fuels and endless war. Politicians always talk about jobs. Every time they run for office, they say they're going to create more jobs. But if they really meant it, then they would be talking about conversion of the military-industrial complex. 
Imagine if similar direct action campaigns and public education efforts were happening in every military production facility and military base in the United States, and even around the world, where the United States has 800 military bases around this planet outside of the United States. Imagine that kind of movement happening around this globe, calling for the conversion of the military industrial complex. One final but important demand of our campaign is to turn the Pentagon into what we call the natural guard. We must change the Pentagon's mission from domination, destruction, and killing to one that stands for rescue, recovery, and reconstruction. Instead of destroyers at Bath Ironworks, we could be building hospital ships that could be useful at some of the terrible uh, climate events that are happening around the world today. Instead of troops on the ground with weapons, we could be sending men and women on missions armed with food and water and medicines. And after, after these dramatic weather events, like that we recently saw in the U.S. when 53 tornadoes hit in one day in the middle of our country. The Natural Guard can help clean up and reconstruct after these weather events. Mother Earth is in toxic shock and her body is desperately thrashing about, calling out to her children to behave and to act right on this planet. <clears throat> Academia, environmental groups who don't normally like to talk about the military, labor unions, and political leadership across the nation and around the world must call for the conversion of the military industrial complex to help us deal with our real problem that you all are discussing today. The crisis we face then is not only this environmental crisis, it's also a spiritual crisis. Our connection to Mother Nature is broken, as I said earlier. We must repair our connection to the sacred who. Our addiction to militarism, consumerism, and capitalism is a disease. We need a global 12-step program to help us heal our broken hearts. I remember the words of Frederick Douglass in closing, one of the great abolitionists of slavery in America. He said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Thank you very much.